Hey everyone, boy, do I have a treat for you today. So we have been discussing on the podcast, Leaky Gut and the importance of Leaky Gut. And I wanted to have a conversation with someone on this who was an expert, who was published and straddled both clinical or patient care and scientific research. And with that, I have for you a fantastic interview with Dr. Michael Kemleri, who is a MD gastroenterologist and is currently doing research and seeing patients at the Mayo Clinic. Formerly, he was the president of the American Gastroenterological Association, that's always a mouthful saying that, and has published a number of papers on leaky gut and is even developing a new and novel biomarker for assessment of leaky gut. We had a wonderful conversation about what foods and lifestyle practices can trigger leaky gut, and conversely, what foods and practices can you do to reduce leaky gut? We talked about assessment and lab testing. This was maybe the most interesting area because as you're probably accustomed to, many tests are marketed as accurate, but few actually are. And we also discussed therapeutic options, probiotics, prebiotics, glutamine, fiber, FODMAPs, a very intelligent, well-read but also humble and inquisitive individual. I truly enjoyed and appreciated the conversation, and I know you will also. And with that, we'll go to the interview with Dr. Michael Camilleri. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to Dr. Russo Radio, providing practical, science-based insights into health, exploring the importance of nutrition, lifestyle, and gut health through conversations with experts, research reviews, and personal stories. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. Hey everyone, today I'm with Dr. Michael Camilleri, who is a very smart guy in the area of gut health. He's published a number of papers on leaky gut, of which I've read a few. So I was super excited, Michael, when you agreed to come on the show. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here, uh, really, especially someone as esteemed as yourself doing work at the Mayo Clinic. I, again, I was really excited to be able to have this conversation about leaky gut. And like we were discussing before we started the recording, I'm always trying to strike that balance between bringing people new and novel information on the one hand, but on the other, not getting swept into speculation, snake oil, chasing whatever's in vogue. And it's people from the scientific, but also clinical community, as I know you're doing both clinical and scientific work, or at least I believe you are, and I guess we'll, we'll come to that in a moment, um, that I think help give people a balanced perspective on issues like leaky gut. Yeah, I think it's really very important to uh, to be as objective as possible and to look at the evidence. And I'm very much a human investigator and I see patients. So much of the evidence that I'm going to discuss pertains to data that are obtained in patients or in human subjects or studies. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So that's one of the things I assumed that as a gastroenterologist, you were seeing patients as well as doing research. So you just answered that question, but tell us a little bit more about, you know, I'll go through your CV when I do the intro separate to this, but you know, how'd you get into gut health and how did leaky gut kind of come onto your radar? So it really starts a long time ago. Um, when I was still a, an early postgraduate student, I studied the effects of chemicals that are produced by the liver called bile acids. Mm. And the reason why we studied this um, was that bile acids are actually a cause of diarrhea. And we see that sure. in the clinic, for instance, in patients after they've had a cholecystectomy, their gallbladder is removed, or they've had a resection of a part of the small intestine that right. results in the bile acid malabsorption. That's the last part of the small intestine. And so that was part of my first thesis, where we studied the effects of bile acids, and we realized that the bile acids were having a detergent effect. They were increasing the permeability or making the colon lining more permeable or leaky. And so right. even before the term leaky gut became popular, we were starting to think about why does the diarrhea occur? Well, it might occur because of the spaces between the cells that are caused by substances which are normally produced in the body. And subsequently, of course, other people also showed that these uh, spaces in this, uh, between the cells also occur in disease states. They may be caused by substances in the diet or medications. So that was my introduction 
into the leaky gut um, many more years ago than I would be uh, willing to admit. <laughs> and just to maybe flag something for people in our audience who I, I think are, they're so eager to improve their health that sometimes they'll do too much. They'll, they'll take too many supplements as one example. And occasionally in the clinic, you'll see someone who's taking a decently high dose of bile acid supplements. And when you review everything, there, there's no good reason that they're doing it. They just, they maybe read how important bile is for absorbing fats. And maybe it's a woman who's saying my hair is kind of thin and my skin's kind of dry. So let me supplement with bile to better absorb fat and have better hair, skin, nails, what have you. When they come off of the bile, all of a sudden their diarrhea goes away because they didn't, they didn't need it. Right. So just to underscore that for our audience, not all the natural supplements that you can buy at Whole Foods or wherever are going to be without side effects. And we want to be sort of judicious with their use. That's so true. And, you know, we know also a lot about the, the chemistry of the different bile acids that the liver produces. And of course, the human body has evolved in such a way with our microbes in the colon, which actually kind of detoxify a lot of those bile acids that are produced by the liver. So the body has two ways of dealing with the bile that's necessary for the absorption of fat. As you mentioned, Michael, one way is to reabsorb 95% of those bile acids in the last part of the small intestine. And then the remaining bile acids, let's say 5 to 10% that escape and get into the colon, are usually modified chemically so that they no longer have those detergent effects, the effects right. that remove the surface mucus, that produce more spaces between the cells, that then right. causes the problems of diarrhea. So yes, indeed, just to come back to your point, it is important to understand when people take supplements um, which might actually be injurious, that there could sure. be a deleterious effect on the way in which their bowel is working. Mm. Uh, great point. And this is one of the reasons the, the sort of terminal ileum, the, the last section of the small intestine is where the bile acid reabsorption occurs. And it's one of the reasons why I find the small intestine to be so important for intestinal health. And I think it's oftentimes overlooked, you know, against the, all the, the research being done on the microbiome and the stool testing that quantifies mainly the colonic microbiome. People forget that the small intestine is where 90 plus percent of nutrients and calories are absorbed. And um, if the bile is not reabsorbed, it can lead to diarrhea. And um, I believe it's the deconjugation of the bile that has to occur to prevent it from having that detergent effect that you're speaking to. So just to underscore for our audience, the small intestine, really important part. And we're going to go into more detail, obviously, in, in the leaky gut segment um, about that. Yes, let me reinforce a couple of those points, if I may. So, yes, Please. the small intestine is absolutely critical for the absorption of 90 to 95 percent of all the nutrients that we take by mouth. The small intestine is really a very smart organ with all of the mm -hmm. enzymes and all of the mixtures with bile and pancreatic juices and also the surface epithelial cells, the villous cells, contain the enzymes that are necessary to break down nutrients including right. even simple nutrients like sugars. Right. So that's the first point. The se second point is, um, indeed, the, the bacteria in the colon do two things to the bile acids. They deconjugate them, as you said, and they also dehydroxylate, which, which really means they change them from primary to secondary bile acids by mm. removing a hydroxyl group, which mm. then makes them less effective at changing the permeability of the intestine. So right. study actually done here at Mayo Clinic in the mid-1970s had shown that the two most important bile acids to damage the colon lining were chenodeoxycholic acid and deoxycholic acid. And so very often um, tests can be done, they're clinical tests, uh, to check the amount of those bile acids that is uh, um, passed into the stool. And that's how we make the diagnosis of bile acid diarrhea. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that point uh, because when I first learned about bile acid diarrhea or malabsorption, you know, you're, as a as an alternative healthcare provider, I'm always trying to figure out 
where is my realm of testing going to be best suited? And then where is it better for a conventional doctor to run this testing? And I felt that was one area. It was better to have a conventional gastroenterologist make that screening and, and perform that assessment. Um, so just for those of us out there um, in the allied healthcare camp, that's at least the the delineation I wanted to make because there's overlap in the Venn diagram, right? We're, you know, we're all working together to presumably help people as much as we can, but no one I think can do everything. I'll probably take a little more time to speak about diet and lifestyle. And with the conventional gastroenterologist, that's where you're going to have a screening for something like bile, uh, bile absorption. So that was just my perspective, but I'll just echo that for people sort of in, in my field who are trying to figure out, you know, how expansive is my workup? Because Again, in, in my opinion, it is important to acknowledge that that line because if you test too much, if you're too broad in your focus, it's hard to do all those things well, to know what the diagnostic criteria is, to know what a true positive is, to know what things can sort of cause a false positive. Um, so anyway, just kind of a remark there for people in my camp. Um, so let me let me ask you a few questions about your thinking about the prevalence of leaky gut in the small intestine versus the large intestine. My speculation has been the majority of leaky gut must occur in the small intestine, just given the fact that this is where 90, 95% of absorption occurs. Um, and there's a few papers where I've been able to get sort of tacit reinforcement of that claim, but I haven't drilled down deeply enough to totally verify that. Is it a fair claim to generally assume that most leaky gut occurs in the small intestine? I think it really is um, a, a very important um, observation and, and uh, consideration that you've just brought. And I'll mention a couple of things. First of all, the permeability or the leakiness of the lining of the intestines is much higher in the small intestine anyway. Right. Second point is that the surface mucus, which is another barrier for leakiness, is different in the small intestine and the colon, okay? Mm. And so that may be another factor. And right. from a practical standpoint, the most important disease states that affect the intestines that cause leakiness, um, yes, I, I will acknowledge ulcerative colitis, a bad inflammation of the colon, or Crohn's disease, which affects the colon, are very significant. But they usually don't they manifest with diarrhea and rectal bleeding. Okay. Right. Whereas we're talking more about what is the impact of leakiness of the intestine that's not causing those overt inflammatory diseases. So, right. examples: celiac disease is a great example that. Uh, there's damage to the lining of the intestine caused by an antigen, a, a protein, gliadin in the diet. And um, another example would be the effects of substances in the diet that, like bile acids, are emulsifiers and they remove that surface mucus or they mm. actually damage the lining itself. And a third example would be medications. Very often we use medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Right. And they are well known to cause an increase in the, in the leakiness and also superficial ulcers in the intestine. So those are just examples that illustrate the point that you've made. And that is that other than those much more obvious, if you wish, disease processes like ulcerative colitis that clearly damages the mucosa and ulcerates right. the mucosa, the ones that are not associated with gross ulceration and bleeding are tending to be more often in the small intestine. Right. Okay. Good. I mean, that, that seemed like a really reasonable inference, but it's good to get verification from someone who's more deeply in the weeds of all the details of, of the what and the where. Um, I wanted to zoom out for a minute and try to get your worldview, if you will, or general perspective on leaky gut. And in, in reading your papers, what I captured is something along the lines of leaky gut may be associated with a number of conditions, but targeting and directly treating the leaky gut probably isn't the most sound approach, but rather we should focus on treating 
whatever the condition is, if it's IBS, treating that as one example, um, is that sort of a fair kind of big picture perspective? I, I think it is. And it goes even beyond just gastroenterological diseases. Um, let, let me expand on that point. So yes. if you read the, the, the lay literature, and even some of the medical literature, it is often claimed, and I'll never forget reading this paper um, a couple of years ago, which almost said that all diseases start in the leaky gut. And of course, it, it caught my attention. But this actually um, drew attention to conditions where the evidence is relatively weak. And we'll talk about the strength right. diagnostic uh, methodology that's available. But to my mind, it is still not completely proven that conditions that affect the nervous system, um, Alzheimer's, this dementia, um, children with autism, there have been so many claims, even obesity, the data are, are somewhat equivocal. Uh, type 1 diabetes, the, type, the data are also somewhat equivocal. So mm. it's very difficult on the basis of the strong evidence that's available for us to review and critically right. appraise from the methodology, it's difficult to support the statement that all diseases start in the leaky gut. And I think it's important to come back to the general point you were making in your introduction, that there is an important role for us as um, you know, gastroenterologists, uh, generalists, um, to, to be a little bit more careful when we attribute the uh, the illness to the leaky gut. And right. the corollary of all of that is, of course, we should treat the underlying disease, not expect that changing the conditions within the intestines, particularly the small intestine, is likely to have a big impact on those general diseases. Yeah. And I think that's really important to echo because as someone who's educating the public on leaky gut, it's hard to strike that balance between let's increase awareness of how your gut might be implicated, but also not lead people to think we have to just target that one thing, uh, you know, that one biomarker in this case. And people may, you know, come into our consulting practice and say, well, I have joint pain. I think it's leaky gut. How do we test leaky gut? How do we treat leaky gut in order to resolve my joint pain? Or same thing for IBS, let's say. And that's where I'll sort of pivot the perspective to leaky gut's probably or could be part of that process. But if there are therapeutics, let's say one example, um, a low FODMAP diet for IBS, let's focus on the diet that improves your symptoms. And I think it's safe to assume that if you feel better, that underlying intermediary mechanisms like leaky gut are probably going to get better at the same time. And, and that's really what we should target. I think that's a very astute point as well, because the benefits from those dietary changes are probably multifactorial. And, and yes. probably the digestive process of the underlying sugars that are not being well managed by the individual's intestine, um, right. that's probably a much more important reason for the bloating and some of the pain and maybe even the diarrhea, because you know, if lactose, uh, you know, the disaccharide in, in, in FODMAP uh, is not absorbed well by about 60% of the world population. And so, you know, that's just an example of it's probably not the leakiness of the intestine that's most relevant, but the yeah. fact that lactose is getting down into the colon and the bacteria love it and they break it right. down, hydrogen and methane, and cause secretion of water. And so the patient gets diarrhea and bloating and pain. So, yes, I, I completely agree that it's important to uh, keep in mind that the benefit may be related to some other mechanism that is being improved by our dietary or our tr other treatment rather than by changing the leaky gut. Mm. And there's limitations to the biomarkers. And, and I want to come to the testing in a moment and talk about there's a general correlation, but there's also good examples we can point to where people become healthier, they have less subjective symptoms, but the biomarker doesn't change. Um, but let's table that for one minute just to make sure that we kind of cover some of the associations between leaky gut and various intestinal conditions. Some of these are, are probably obvious and, and the kind of general heuristic I use with people is the more digestive symptoms you have and maybe the more systemic symptoms you have, 
we could assume there's a degree of leaky gut present as a general heuristic. But you know, again, we want to be careful not to just claim everything is because of leaky gut. What details would you kind of pepper in underneath that sort of broad claim? So what, some of the best evidence for um, the involvement of the leaky gut, as you said, would be um, the induction of sort of inflammatory process. Um, there are good experimental models that have changed the, the intestinal lining and that have been associated with the development of signs of inflammation. We'll just call them like that. Um, sure. so that's one way to think about it. A good example, and you mentioned it earlier, um, is, is joint involvement, for instance, um, in quotes, arthritis, something that could be related. And yes, indeed, there are data in significant joint diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, where the evidence of um, increased leakiness of the intestine seems to be relatively um, well established. Right. You know, on the other hand, let's keep in mind that in much more common conditions that we gastroenterologists see, like irritable bowel syndrome, there are other mechanisms that are going to be at play um, that are causing those systemic symptoms. We know that the gut can be more sensitive to distension, to the presence right. of nutrients that are sort of maldigested in the intestine, and that stimulates the nerves that connect the gut to the brain. Um, right. And of course, we also know that psychological disturbances in those individual patients may also impact the degree to which they experience those pains. So right. this is my way of trying to explain that, you know, there may be other mechanisms that are responsible for those sure. systemic or brain features, and they may not necessarily be related to the very significant inflammatory processes. Now, of course, I'll be the first to say in patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease who develop joint pains, that's a very real issue with inflammation. But those yeah. are diseases that have a much more leaky gut. They have, it's, it's an order of magnitude higher. And so it's much more likely that the, the uh, food proteins, the bacterial proteins are crossing across, going across the mucosa and causing that systemic inflammation, as well as the inflammation in the intestines themselves. And so right. that's what sort of triggers the, the systemic inflammation then might land in the joints of the hands or the back and present with small joint or large joint arthropathy. Mm -hmm. I mean, great points. I love that you mentioned pain and inflammation. And you know, one of the things that I, I find interesting is that at least in some of the papers regarding bloating and or distension, the researchers have commented that there can be normal levels of gas, but hypersensitivity to that gas, and it might be due to inflammation causing someone to be more sensitive to something like substance P, which is sort of a, a nociceptor or, or a pain regulator. So could leaky gut be part of that process? Maybe, right? But the inflammation might be what's best to target. And not that I'm trying to overly sort of... um point to the low FODMAP diet just makes such a good example of one diet that's been shown to lower inflammation. And so it might be that the low FODMAP diet through decreasing inflammatory cytokines, and there's other diets one can use, right? But just again, one, one example to keep building upon that, it might be the anti-inflammatory benefit that leads to a reduction in pain. And could something like zonulin shift in a positive way? Sure. But I think we're in agreement that that's not necessarily something that you need to do a baseline zonulin and then repeat zonulin at three weeks. And if the zonulin is not where you want it to be, make more changes and repeat another three weeks. This is what my field, I feel, does not do very well. And it wastes a lot of money and, and uh, focus for, for individuals. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that's a, a great example. And I just want to build upon the inflammation because even though the leakiness of the intestine may result in the food antigen or bacterial antigen, the proteins, um, getting across the lining and stimulating inflammation within the, um, the mucosa of the intestine. And let's keep in mind that that mucosa and that inflammation, those cytokines, as you mentioned, may be stimulating 
those nerves which convey the sensation of pain right. from the intestine to the spinal cord and then up to the brain. So um, I think it's important to keep in mind, um, more from a holistic standpoint, that the leakiness itself may just be the first step that ultimately leads those um, immunologically active substances to right. aggravate the inflammation within the lining of the intestine, which then sends the message through nerve pathways to uh, induce the pain that the patient might experience. And then, of course, if there is maldigestion and there is distension, apart from the inflammation, there's also the mechanical stimulation of those nerves, which then results in further stimulation of the afferent, the, the, the messenger pathways that take right. the message to the brain. So if people are getting a little bit lost in some of these details, a nice antidote to the confusion is clinical outcome studies, right? We take a group of people, half of them get an intervention, half get placebo, and we see, does this end up working for what you as a patient care about? Bloating, joint pain. And so this is why I have, and I know Michael, you're similar in wanting to look at clinical trials to inform what decisions we make rather than speculating, well, it could be increase this or decrease that. And therefore we're going to, you know, make all these decisions based upon kind of speculating rather than saying, well, okay, let's take RA as an example. You mentioned rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, not to say this is a fully flushed out scientific case, but there was at least one paper. There may be two now in existence that gave people an elemental diet and found equivalent results for improving RA as a cortical, excuse me, a corticosteroid um, anti-inflammatory uh, medication. So it's that sort of data that I think we should be looking to, to inform, okay, the RA patient is going to see a couple doctors, you know, one conventional, maybe one alternative. They may have different recommendations, but as long as they're moored by clinical trials, we're not going to subject people to being the guinea pig of the pet theory the doctor may have without any good clinical science to back up the recommendation. I, I love that point, Michael. And um, one of the things that we tried to do in one of the articles that you kindly mentioned was we actually did go and uh, um, you know, through the exercise of trying to summarize some of that information about mm -hmm. clinical trials. So let me give you a couple of, of, of examples of how the clinical trial data have really informed me as a prescriber as well, or mm -hmm. as somebody who's becoming a little bit closer to the way you approach things, which is also to think about uh, the diet as a, as a potential uh, area for intervention. So if you look at all of the literature on prebiotics and probiotics that very often are mentioned as uh, treatments for the leaky gut, the most valid information comes from a clinical trial, which I believe was done by colleagues in Chicago, and they showed that a specific species of bifidobacteria and galacto-oligosaccharides, one being probiotic, the other prebiotic, were efficacious compared to placebo, as you mentioned, in reducing whatever it was that they were measuring. Now, they were measuring mostly not clinical endpoints, but laboratory-based endpoints, okay, like we will mention later. So. Okay. At least that gives us the proof of concept that there could be an improvement with a probiotic and a prebiotic. What um, my colleague Adrian Vella, who's an endocrinologist and uh, interested in nutrition as well here at Mayo Clinic, he and I um, reviewed the literature, for example, to show that reducing emulsifiers in the diet can also improve the patient's uh, endpoints, but most important, mm -hmm. These were done using the laboratory tests um, that uh, you know provide us with proof of concept. So right. yes, I do think that uh, we do need to use you know the highest level of evidence based on clinical trials, and sometimes um, also systematic reviews have been able to uh, put some of this information together. Yeah. I must admit that the methodology uh, of, of measurement may not be sufficiently standardized to make it easy to do those type of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. But nevertheless, I do agree with you that there are high levels of evidence based on placebo-controlled trials for certainly the two examples I gave you. And in my own 
field of interest, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. There's a paper by uh, colleagues Nick Vern and Kiki Zhao who showed that glutamine, for example, improves the um, the permeability measurements in patients mm. with bowel syndrome. So again, there is accumulating evidence based on the highest level of evidence with 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 placebo controlled trials of beneficial effects on leaky guts. And to try to tie the great points, by the way, and to try to tie this to some relevancy for people in our audience who may be viewing podcasts, reading blogs, and you feel you have a just wide array of options, dietary changes, supplements, what can help prioritize which ones you should consider first would be the ones that have better evidence. So just to close that loop for people, it's not that I think any doctor is trying to be dismissive when they look to having higher quality evidence. It's they want to try to give you the highest probability that what you do, what you spend your money on is going to produce a positive result rather than just potentially wasting your money. So I'll answer that in two ways. The first is to say that the the most cost-effective thing to do is to remove the substances that may be damaging the gut and causing the leaky gut. And so I, I think it's important to keep in mind, as we said, you know, we had the example of the bile acid supplement, which may be a, a factor. Um, we know that alcohol um, uh, ingested um, can have a, a deleterious effect on the leaky gut and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So those would be, and of course, if, you have a propensity to develop celiac disease, then gluten in the diet is another factor. So those are the four things I always keep in mind when I start um, consulting with a patient. Let's first of all, remove the stuff that may be damaging your GI tract. Okay. Now, having done that, then I do think that based on the evidence that we have, um, supplementation of a galacto-oligosaccharide prebiotic. And among the probiotics, the best evidence comes from um, the study I, I mentioned before on bifidobacteria species. Those seem to be the agents that, um, that have the best benefit. And I mentioned glutamine as well. And in one of those articles which we, um, which we published, one of our dietitians here at Mayo Clinic kindly helped us by giving us a list of the foods that contained the, the good substances. Oh, I, one other thing I forgot to mention Please. was emulsifiers. So highly sort of processed foods right. also have the types of, of, of agents. Um, I'm not a chemist, so I, I can't tell you more than that. Um, that could be uh, like bile acids, removing the surface mucus and making yep. the, the intestine more permeable, more leaky. So those are the, the main things that I would mention. So a number of threads there to pick up on. I, I love this conversation. Um, to echo, ultra processed food, something that isn't going to help people with anything really. Um, and we did come across a paper that this was looking at multiple endpoints. I think there was neurodegenerative diseases, gastrointestinal diseases, but they tried to quantify at what level of processed food consumption do you start to see a jump in symptoms? And it was 18%, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly. I believe it was 18%. So as long as there's less than 18% of those foods in your diet, you might be okay. Now, I'm not advocating the consumption of ultra-processed food, but as someone who sees a lot of people who really care about improving their health, sometimes they develop this sort of orthorexia, this, this fear of food. Because they don't want to eat gluten, dairy, soy, lectins, FODMAP, salicylates, emulsifiers. And then they end up on the other end of the spectrum, which is the withdrawing from going out to dinners and, and their social life. They're underweight. They're not sleeping well. So, uh, you know, a, a little bit of almost anything is probably okay within reason. And I think that includes alcohol. Probably not something that's going to help anybody. But, you know, if if you have a... a weekly dinner with friends and people are going to have a couple glasses of wine. Do you need to shy away from that? You know, again, if you don't want to drink, you don't have to drink. That's fine. But, um, you know, I try to be good about leaving that little crack in the door for people so they don't develop sort of uh, food neuroses. Um, what's your perspective on 
what might be a reasonable level of consumption of processed food, of, of alcohol? Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, I completely agree with that point. Uh, I mean, the last thing we want to do is to get people to shy away from having a, a reasonable, well-balanced diet and to, um, you know, benefit. One of the most important things in, in the cultures that probably you and I both come from is having mm. uh, <laughs> an enjoyable meal with your friends or with your family. So absolutely, you know, the, I, I, I hesitate to try to give a percentage. Um, because I honestly have not studied it and I have not seen it, um, you know, documented. Sure. In the but the levels that you mentioned make complete sense to me. And I think we need to bring a, a, a modicum of common sense to these issues when we make right. our recommendations on dietary and uh, alcohol intake. And, and the levels that you mentioned are certainly not, not worrisome. Seem reasonable, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, as an Italian, I'm sure you've had many uh, a wonderful conversation with you know some bread and some wine. Uh, and I do want to come back to the prevalence of non-celiac gluten sensitivity because I think this will help give people some um, perception of how probable issues with gluten might be. But I did want to double click on some of the biomarkers. You know, one of the things from 2023 that I found really interesting was this meta-analysis published in Frontiers in Immunology. And they looked at the effect of probiotics on leaky gut. And what was interesting is they found benefits, you know, consistent benefits as summarized in the meta-analysis of probiotics to reduce leaky gut, but specifically when leaky gut was measured as serum or blood zonulin. And they did not find the corresponding finding for stool zonulin, which to me as a provider who used to order somewhat routinely stool zonulin was a real eye-opener. Ah, all these assumptions, we are, again, coming back to the um, caution with assumptions and speculations we touched on earlier, I was, and I'm assuming many people were assuming that stool zonulin could be a reliable marker. And it seems that's not the case. Um, and I know there's a few other markers, but maybe we just start on zonulin and, and how you feel about that marker. The documentation that zonulin is a marker particularly of intestinal permeability, and it was first validated, as far as I can recall, in celiac disease, um, was, was done by Alessio Fasano and his colleagues at Massachusetts General uh, in the Harvard uh, system. And that was a really interesting study. Um, Zondelin, of course, is, is basically a protein that's similar to the degradation of one of the tight junction proteins between the cells of the intestine. So it looks very, very interesting to be able to find that either in the stool or in the peripheral blood. So the convenience of either the stool zonulin or the blood serum yeah. zonulin is, is obviously very attractive. Now, the problem with the commercially available, um, most often performed assay is that unfortunately the same people that originally described the utility of zonulin, the Fasano group, actually documented that the assay doesn't measure zonulin itself, but it measures a compound or a, or a chemical that's in the same sort of class, but not zonulin itself. And mm -hmm. they drew attention to the fact that it may not be that accurate um, a, a marker. So it will be great. I'm sorry, just, just really quick for our audience. If, if you've been watching the communication from some of these labs, this was maybe three years ago, they updated it from calling it zonulin because of the point you're making to zonulin family protein or proteins, because they, they learned that it wasn't technically zonulin. It was a little bit broader than that. And because of that, the accuracy was perhaps skewed a bit. Yeah, but I think uh, just to build upon that, I, I would love to see, you know, the validation, again, whether it's in celiac disease or in other situations, that the family of proteins related to zonulin are actually um, as good a marker as the original zonulin Absolutely. was, was, yeah. was um, validated. So, yep. yes, I mean, I'd love to see um, a, a blood test uh, to become available for for this uh, evaluation of, of leakiness of the gut. There are other, other blood samples that one could use. There's uh, 
um, the fatty acid binding protein from the intestine, IFABP, which mm. is another marker, but it may be more of a marker of damage to the intestine. So it may not be as sensitive to pick up leaky gut without significant damage to the intestine. So sure. if you have somebody with celiac disease, it may be very positive. But if you have somebody with gluten sensitivity, it may not be as informative. Right. And so, you know, more and more, and these assays are commercially available, and this goes back probably 40 years, um, people have used oral sugars and oral probes and then measured their arrival in the urine as measures of permeability. And right. this is something that we've worked on here as well uh, at Mayo Clinic. Um, much of the literature is based on lactulose to mannitol ratio, which means that two sugars are taken by mouth, lactulose and mannitol. Other papers looked at lactulose and rhamnose, which is another monosaccharide like mannitol. And so the ratio, or as we have found in our studies, the actual mass excreted. So rather than dividing the mannitol excretion into the lactulose excretion, getting a ratio, we think it's more important to actually see how much of the sugar that's given by mouth actually gets into the urine. Keep in mm. mind that these are sugars, whether it's mannitol, lactulose, sucralose, or rhamnose, they are sugars that are absorbed from the intestine, they are not metabolized by the body, and they appear in the urine intact. And so if you have a good HPLC, um, um, accurate method to measure them, we were able to, for instance, reduce the amount of these sugars tenfold from what the, they used to do 10 years mm. ago even, um, um, and, and therefore reduce the load, for instance, of lactulose, because lactulose can cause diarrhea. The less side so effects you, when doing the test. When you're doing the test, yeah. you, you don't want to perturb the intestine. So yeah. there Which are- Which is a legit thing. I, I, you know, just really quick, I've had some people who were really scared to do a repeat SIBO breath test with lactulose because of the reaction that they had to it. So you're, you're making a great point. Yeah. I mean, in the past, people used to use 10 grams of lactulose. We've now brought it down to one gram of lactulose and mm. we get 100 milligrams of 13 carbon mannitol. Now you might ask, why have you made life so complicated, Michael? <laughs> so what we found when we did a study of 60 healthy volunteers aged from 18 to 70, and we studied them three times, we found that there is, even before we've given them mannitol by mouth for the test, they have mannitol in their urine because mannitol is present in many foods. It's present in cosmetics and other creams that are applied to the skin. So the point is that we have, um, let me just call it a healthy skepticism regarding some of the data um, that pertains to lactulose to mannitol ratio. And the main reason is the contamination with the mannitol. The other reason is that if you look at people who don't have significant ulceration of the intestine, who have maybe only taken a, a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug, the amount of lactulose that's actually excreted in the urine is only one to 5% of the lactulose that you've given them by mouth. So mm -hmm. the signal is relatively small and a very small change in that signal would have a very big impact on the lactulose to mannitol ratio. Right. So on those studies, and I'll stop for breath in a minute, um, on those studies we showed that about 30% of the monosaccharide, lactulose, sorry, mannitol or rhamnose is absorbed through a 24 hour period, whereas only one to 5% of the lactulose is absorbed. But mm. I think that we can improve on the way in which we can screen for leaky gut if we use the right sugar probe molecules. Yeah, I saw that in in some of your papers, and I was I was quite keen to learn more about this, especially the the mannitol and and so what I'm taking away is the the 13 C mannitol is not found in foods and cosmetics, so it doesn't have the the skewing. That's great. So 
13 carbon is a naturally occurring type of carbon. It is a stable isotope. It's not radioactive. And in nature, about 1 to 2 percent of all the carbon in nature is actually 13 carbon. Mm. So when you just take, and we did this, uh, as I said in our paper, we actually studied the amount of 13 carbon in the urine before we gave any mannitol 13 carbon or the other one. Mm. And what we found was there was no 13 carbon mannitol in the urine on three occasions in 60 people. So we think there's no contamination by 13 carbon before we give the 100 milligrams as part of our test. Now, is this a marker? I'm assuming it's not yet in availability for routine clinical assessment. It, it is not yet uh, routinely available. Correct. Okay. So the okay. commercially available tests still uses uh, naturally occurring 12 carbon sugars, whether it's right. mannitol or rhamnose. Now, right. okay. So if I had a choice, quite honestly, because we found far less contamination by rhamnose, I would use rhamnose as the monosaccharide. Having said that, my colleagues in, in pediatric gastroenterology did a study and actually found that kids with, uh, who are being screened for celiac disease actually had some rhamnose in their urine. So it isn't completely free of contamination, right. but it's certainly much better than what we found with um, ordinary mannitol. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a bigger theme here to maybe just acknowledge really quick, which is sometimes what's being used in research papers is not the same thing that the lab, the commercial lab is using. It sounds similar, but it's different enough to have not been validated. And it's, you know, in defense of the doctors out there who are using these tests to try to help people, it's not the easiest thing in the world to know that. And, and you know, having a, a small research team that works alongside me, it's a decent amount of work to get the data, to fact check. Um, but I think in keeping with your earlier comment about skepticism, healthcare providers and patients should be much more skeptical about testing. And I say both the doctors and the patients because sometimes doctors are under pressure from the patient to do the test. And if the doctor won't do the test, the patient gets frustrated because they don't think the doctor wants to help them. Um, so I'll, I'll just offer that as something I'm seeing as a, a really growing problem where the, the, the naturopathy schools and the chiropractic schools and the integrative um, conferences, you're seeing more and more lab funding into these events. They sponsor lunches, they sponsor the entire event, which can be all fine and good, but just to call attention to the fact that there's a lot of market pressure to get patients to want testing and doctors to do the testing. And I, I want to make sure that both patients and doctors understand that more testing doesn't equal better results. More testing doesn't mean your doctor care more about you. And, and just, you know, put that out there so that people don't succumb to the thinking that I read a paper on zonulin for leaky gut. That's going to be the same test I get Monday morning with my, you know, local healthcare provider. Yeah, I think the point is very well taken. <clears throat> um, you did ask whether the, the, the test that we've used in our research is available, and unfortunately, it is not yet available clinically. I, I just would like to mention, and, and I have absolutely no personal conflict of interest, no commercial or financial interest, but um, the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic is in the process of uh, launching such a test to become available. Great. But I hope so, you don't mind if I... No, no. I mean, if there is a test that we should point people to, let's please point. Um, is there, you know, outside of that, which is currently being worked on by Mayo, is there a test that's commercially available that you would recommend people consider? Well, unfortunately, I, I would suggest that the closest I would get to being confident would be to do a lactulose to rhamnose ratio. That if I were to select one, that would be it. Um, and then if people are concerned that there might be some damage in the intestine, then, you know, uh, measurement of um, intestinal fatty acid binding protein or the zonulin family of peptides might be, might be a good um, alternative. With the caveat that I'm still not completely uh, satisfied with the degree to which the uh, 
Zonulin family has been validated for identifying leaky gut. Right. And I'm going to ask a question here. It's definitely getting into the weeds, but would a commercial lab have clear guidelines on the interpretation of the lactose or lactulose uh, remnose ratio? I do think that, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't usually request that. So I am not conversant with what okay. commercial apps provide. Okay. Um, I also think that it, it would be really good to express the data, not just as a ratio, but as the percentage of the monosaccharide rhamnose and the percentage of disaccharide lactulose that is right. being um, excreted in the urine. We have normal values and we continue to enlarge our normal value database. Um, and that's right. one of the reasons why the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic still requires my lab to get the normal data so that they will right. have robust data for, for yeah. establishing those uh, yeah. diagnostic criteria. And, you know, part of the reason why I asked that question, you know, again, just for our audience's edification is there's been a few labs when we fact checked the reference ranges and actually spoke with someone, they said, oh yeah, we did a, a in-lab study, 30 people who are healthy and 15 people who had IBS or IBS-like symptoms. And that was how they validated the reference range. And, you know, again, doctors and lay people look at the report. It looks really official, high, low, black, red, whatever. And we have to really, I think it's a healthcare community, start probing more into the details, telling us, you know, is this range validated or is it more of a, of a theory? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, a reference range from a group of 30 people is not yeah. very robust. I can tell you, right. um, we are close to 100 in our a healthy volunteer uh, database. And I think lab medicine will not move um, with developing reference ranges until uh, we've got a really robust database. And even, you know, my statisticians tell me that if you've got a, a, a group of 100 people, you should not use the 5th and 95th percentile, but the 10th and 90th percentile for that reference range. Um, so your cutoff is a little bit um, more robust. And they usually recommend that the 5th and 95th percentile should be used when your normal uh, volunteer re reference is based on more than 200 or 250 people. Mm. That's great. So, yeah, and, and you know, if I were to see the reference range based on thirty, I would really want to know: is that just the interquartile range, or is it the tenth and ninetieth, or the fifth and ninetieth percentile? Yeah, and I mean the the point or a point that builds upon this is with some of these tests, you'll see virtually everyone you do have a positive. Um, you know, and some doctors get excited about that. Well, everyone everyone's got leaky gut. And, you know, yeah, I don't mean to be, you know, too much speaking to our, our practitioner audience, but I think these points are so salient, which is if you're doing a test and you hardly ever see a negative, it probably tells you there's false positives rampant in that test. And it could come back to the point you're making in part, which is kind of sloppy methodology for setting their reference ranges. I would agree. Coming over to food for a moment, uh, we hit processed food, emulsifiers, alcohol, Gluten is one that is really interesting in the sense that I do feel there was a population of people who were underserved by only saying avoid gluten if you have full-blown celiac. And later we learned that non-celiac gluten sensitive um, is actually a thing. And there are people who fit into that camp. And if they avoid gluten, they'll see improvements in their symptoms. There's a interesting sort of flavor of late, which is Part of what drives NCGS might be FODMAP intolerance because gluten is high in FODMAP. So, you know, it might be antigenic, sure. And I think that's that's valid, but there also might be some people for whom it's more so uh, microbiome, if you want to say. It's just, you know, they, they can't metabolize the FODMAPs. What's hopeful, at least in my mind there, is if you look at the FODMAP clinical trials, there's a pretty good success rate for reintroduction after elimination. So FODMAP tolerance is something that seems to be able to be improved over time, whereas if it's more immune, like true, I guess we would say, non-celiac gluten sensitive, that might be more lifelong, 
again, it hasn't been established. That's just kind of the way I think through this. Um, but I guess zooming out, how do you think about gluten and uh, how, how prevalent of an issue do you think it is? I, I, I really appreciate you bringing this up. Um, it, it so happens that with my colleagues here at Mayo Clinic, Joe Murray is a, a, a world expert on celiac disease. And so we joined forces. And um, Maria Vasquez Roque was the fellow and now a staff member at, at Mayo Clinic in, in Jacksonville. Um, mm. She was the person who anchored the study I'm going to tell you about. So we studied mm. patients who had been given a diagnosis of diarrhea predominant irritable bowel. And we studied um, in a randomized study, we looked to see whether gluten would um, produce any changes um, in, guess what, the leaky gut. Mm. And we actually showed that patients um, could have an increase in the permeability of their intestine if they have so-called irritable bowel syndrome. And that is how I think some of the patients, yes, the, the FODMAP story is, is legitimate, but also it is conceivable that the patients who happen to have the immunogenotype that predisposes to celiac disease, which happens to be the HLA DQ2 DQ8, what our yep. study showed was that the patients who were HLA DQ2 DQ8 and who were um, exposed to gluten were the ones that had the greatest increase in the permeability of their intestine measured mm. with our um, assay, which is the 13 carbon mannitol um, and lactulose assay. So there is the possibility that the patients uh, who have um, gluten sensitivity without celiac disease may indeed have a minor form of inflammation, if you wish, right. that's caused by this increased permeability of the intestine, increased leakiness, and they may be predisposed genetically because they are carriers of those two HLA types. So I do think that in addition to the um, issue about gluten being high in the high FODMAP diet, it is also possible that there is an effect on the permeability of the intestine, on the leakiness of the intestine. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Do, uh, do, what was the prevalence, if, if you happen to know, of the people who had either symptomatic reactivity or the leaky gut? Or, or both? My recollection was that about 70% of the people with the immunogenotype wow. actually had evidence of increased permeability. Now, that paper is almost 10 years old, so I may have to go back and look okay. at the details again. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's high. Um, you know, the, the reason why I ask is, again, the perspective I bring is, is working with people who care so much about their health they're they're making so many changes that sometimes you have to kind of bridle them and say, well, you know, again, I realize that you've read about salicylates, FODMAP, selectins, you know, histamines, all these things, but they can't all be a problem for you, right? So we kind of do an elimination, a reintroduction, try to get a sense for what elicits symptoms. And we do that against a backdrop of prevalence data. So we have a sense for, is it 70%? Is it 50%? Is it 5%? And one of the, or, you know, there's been a number of papers looking at NCGS and the ranges are kind of broad, but they're still within a camp of maybe 0.3% up to 13% is the range that I've seen. So I look at that as maybe we average NCGS at five, six, 7% of the population. Do you feel that's a fair estimation? I think that is a fair estimation. I just wanted to make uh, to clarify. Um, Please, what I mentioned earlier was the people who were in that study with the genetic type who actually had an increase in permeability. I was not talking about symptoms. So this was, gotcha. you know, biomarker based estimate, and okay. and I wouldn't be um, so courageous to say that that applies to 70% of people, for instance, with IBS area. So yes, okay. I do appreciate that the proportion with true NCGS is probably um, averaging around 5%. And I'm glad you made the clarification because, you know, I think it's it's so hard for, for researchers who are getting into the weeds of some of these analyses to share the information without people in the public maybe misconstruing that to, you know, 
Dr. Kim Larry said it was 70% of people who will get leaky gut from gluten. And it's, well, it's not necessarily what you're saying. You're sharing a finding with a, a new and novel and super interesting biomarker, but that needs to be flushed out more robustly before we can commit to a 70% prevalence. Absolutely. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah. And then for people, you know, and I'm curious your perspective on this. I think your symptomatic reaction to a food goes a long way in helping you determine, should you eat that food or should you not eat that food? Meaning, do you cut it out? Are you less bloated? Do you have less joint pain? And when you bring it back in, do you notice those symptoms return? And have you done that a couple of times to make sure it wasn't a fluke and seen a decently clear association between a food and a reaction? Is, is that fair? I think that's perfectly fair. I, I think that um, most often, at least the patients that I see may already have tried many of those approaches, but sure. um, you're absolutely right. Just the, the, what I really like about, you know, the strategy with, with, um, changing the diet for FODMAPs is the, the concept of re-challenging. You know, yeah. uh, you've tried it, you've withdrawn it, there was a bit of an improvement. Um, okay, let's re-challenge and let's see what happens. And let's then withdraw it again and see what happens. And I think patients are very good, uh, you know, observers of what's happening with their bodies. So I, I sure. agree with comments. With one caveat, which I've picked up in some people wherein this will happen with gluten or maybe with dairy. They never eat it unless let's say it's one of those nights where they were out late, they had beer and then pizza. And so the reintroduction is really confounded by you know processed food, being up late, maybe drinking. So I tell people, well, let's make sure your only reintroductions don't occur in that sort of scenario so that you don't have this sort of confounded association between, you know, I was tired the next day. Well, <laughs> maybe you were tired because you were up until one o'clock in the morning and you had four glasses of wine, which is all fine and good, right? But we just don't, don't want to overly attribute that fatigue, let's say, you know, just to the wheat and the cheese that you had in the pizza. Yeah, that's that's fair. Can I can I just um, tell you about a little bit about a, a story about uh, dairy and lactose intolerance? Please. It's really interesting that these studies were done at the University of Minnesota probably two or three decades ago. And I only mentioned it because lactose is such a prevalent issue. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned before, the world population, 60% of people probably have lactose intolerance or they don't produce enough lactase in their intestines to break down the sugar in milk. So Dr. Michael Levitt at the University of Minnesota, just up the street from where I am, 75 miles away. And uh, <laughs> Dr. Joe Kolars uh, was uh, a young doctor at the time, did these studies um, where they took patients with known lactose intolerance and they gave them um, a volume of milk. I can't remember whether it was a half pint of milk, let's say. And they got symptoms, which is what you'd expect. And then another time, they gave them the same amount of milk, but they staggered it throughout the day. Mm. The total dose, as it were, was the same, but patients were able to tolerate it when it was taken not in large volumes. And oh, they also point. showed in a separate paper, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that yogurt contains lactase and it can sometimes help people to absorb the lactose. Right. So these are some clues that I sometimes use as well with my patients. Yes, you know, low. Uh, uh, lactase deficiency is a highly prevalent problem and it's more and more common in people of you know Southeast Asian and uh, also African uh, extraction and also people from the, the Mediterranean littoral right. you know have up to 15 or 20 percent of people and people who come from close to the equator in their genes have maybe 90 percent involvement with with uh, hypolactasia but there are ways in which to reintroduce lactose without having the deleterious effects. And, and then if necessary, one can also have um, supplementation of, of, of the enzyme. But I just thought that I'd pick up on that point from your- Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, you know, it, it, it hints at something that, that I try to advise on, which is reasonable avoidance and, and not to think about things very dichotomously, very extremely, 
And that ties back in with the social piece, which is, you know, we want people to be able to have food freedom and not feel like they're really backed into a corner of a highly restrictive diet because that can be quite stressful. I often say that something I heard from my mother, that common sense is not that common. And it's <laughs> yeah. important to use common sense. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Um, so something that may be a little bit kind of non-common sensical or counterintuitive, I think is the role of prebiotics in gut health. And it's there's a little bit of a divergence here where at least the way I interpret the data is people who have decently healthy guts do okay with increasing their fiber, increasing their prebiotic intake. The more you see something like IBS as one example, to some extent IBD, to some extent maybe reflux and bloating, that's where higher fiber, higher FODMAP, higher prebiotics can be a challenge. So there, and I'm just taking this from the literature that people do really well on low FODMAP who have, let's say, IBS, some data for IBD. Um, so the the kind of paradox here is there's all this discussion about how important it is to feed your gut bacteria. But then for people with active symptoms, actively feeding the gut bacteria, at least while they're symptomatic, may flare them. Um, and there's been you know a few meta-analyses on the low FODMAP diet and IBS, one from just, I think, two years ago. So I wouldn't say it's an airtight scientific case, but I think there's enough data to say, sure, like the low FODMAP diet is something worth consideration if someone's not feeling well. But it is paradoxical in a way that it's it's kind of starving bacteria. The way I've reconciled that is, you know, coming back to the small intestine, it might be an issue that people just don't have adequate ability to digest those compounds in the small intestine. And that's where we want to think about sort of restoring eubiosis in that small intestinal ecosystem by a little bit of a starvation, almost like a, a fast to maybe someone has diabetes and a fast for them could help with um, balancing their blood sugar. But I'm, you know, I'm curious how you think about FODMAPs, prebiotics, and, and I know it's a really broad question, but um, how do you think about this? So as I said before, um, from the evidence-based perspective, the Prebiotics, uh, the only one that I've seen, at least in my review of the literature, was was the galacto-oligosaccharides, which, uh, mm -hmm. which were helpful. So, okay, I'll, I'll accept that. I have to tell you that um, I'm more and more convinced that we need to take some of the learnings from the low FODMAP diet trials and try to use an approach which which um, we think is is sensible and that is to be a little more, more selective when we apply the low fodmap diet so let me expand mm -hmm. upon that point okay when you think about fodmap you've got um you know fructose which is um often a problem but mm -hmm. it's most often a problem, I think, when patients take high fructose corn syrup, and 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 therefore trying to avoid that is something that's not as general as saying you can't take fructose in normal fruit. Okay, All right. Sure. So, so that's kind of bringing the common sense story back. Oligosaccharides, you know, may, mainly these are um, monosaccharides that that are. Um, very specific and and that it, it's much more difficult i think to identify you know where they are in the diet disaccharides right. there's no doubt in my mind if somebody's lactose intolerant we need to manage that monosaccharides and let me tell you that the very good work done in the 1970s and 1980s had shown that the human body the human small intestine absorbs glucose and galactose with great efficiency within two meters of the ligament of trites out of the six meters of small intestine mm. all of those simple monosaccharides were absorbed so monosaccharides are things that i'm a little bit more lax with okay sure um 
phenols, yes, I think we need to keep in mind that there are many artificial sweeteners that are introduced, and obviously we need to try to avoid them if we can. Um, the diabetic patient with artificially sweetened drinks is an example of that. The one thing that I will keep in mind is the first F. I'm going to come back to the F, and that is fructans, because as you know, fructans are not digested and not absorbed by the human intestine, by the human small intestine. And so mm. fructans are going to get down to the colon where the bacteria love it and they go crazy over the fructans, produce all the gases and the bloating and the discomfort, etc. So we tend to do more of what we call a bottom up rather than a top down. We tend to mm. talk to patients. I like that. What are the things? Let's go through the diet. Let's go through the FODMAP and let's try to identify what might be substances that have not agreed with you. And I explained, for instance, that onion and garlic are very uh, sorry, are very high in fructans. And so, you know, those might be ways in which you could reduce the amount of fructans in your diet, etc. So I won't go through that rigmarole. Yeah. And Either, but to say that there might be an approach to make the low FODMAP diet bottom up, identifying by dialogue with the patient, which might be the injurious sugars, and then try to build upon that, be a bit more selective in what is restricted in the diet, and then use the same approach, which is, okay, let's generalize the diet, let's see if it made a difference, and then let's go back to re-challenging and mm. then be um, um, removing those injurious sugars from the diet. So I just yeah. thought I'd spend a little bit of time explaining how some of us also use the bottoms up, the bottom up approach for the, the FODMAP diet. Yeah, I, I like that approach. And, and what I'm seeing in my mind as you say that is different people would probably resonate with different approaches. Some people are sort of really overachievers and they do best when they just kind of throw everything off the table and do a more strict elimination. And then other people... They may have a lot going on in their life. It's harder to restrict many foods. And so a simplified approach, uh, a stepwise, bottom-up, as you said, approach works better. And yeah, I, I really like that actually, because it, it allows you to do an even further personalization of the dietary approach that's going to meet the person where they're at. Yeah. One thing I wanted to mention on prebiotics, and, and this meta-analysis is a few years old, but I only came across it just recently. Um, although I may have, I, I may be conflating this with another meta-analysis from 2023, but I looked at prebiotics in irritable bowel syndrome. It's from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They weren't looking at zonulin. They were looking at symptoms, but they did not find that quality of life or gastrointestinal symptoms were improved by the prebiotics that were summarized in this meta-analysis. Um, and yeah, I've I've kind of gone back and forth on prebiotics. Before this paper, I was a little bit more neutral in terms of there's some pretty impressive data for glucose lowering effects from prebiotics. I think that was probably the best area in which prebiotics had merit. The IBS literature also always seemed a little bit mixed to me. This meta-analysis has made me a little bit more paused in terms of supplemental prebiotics. I think getting someone to a broad diet where they're, they're their whole food intake of prebiotics, that's a great goal. But as it pertains to, do we want to be giving you inulin, GOS, FOS? I, I still think the answer there is maybe, and I take your point about the study that you you mentioned, and I'm, I'm curious to go look that up. But um, have you come across that meta-analysis and, and does that sway your, your thinking at all? It does. Um, um, I, I can't remember exactly that meta-analysis, but, um, you know, in, in the report that we produced, the paper we published in gut, looking at what to do about leaky gut, we have a number of tables where we've tried to summarize the literature. And mm. um, I, as I said, the only, the only paper that really convinced me was the one from, from the Chicago group, the Rush group, that, that looked at the GOS as, as a potential benefit. And the interesting thing as well was that the bifidobacterial species was beneficial, the GOS was beneficial, but the two together, there was no additive benefit mm. from having the prebiotic and the probiotic together. So I, I still need to be convinced, like yourself, 
that yeah. the prebiotics have a beneficial effect. The, as I said, the in, in terms of IBS, the most convincing data really comes from the paper by Nikki, uh, Nick Verne and Kiki Zhao on glutamine. I think that's more robust. Um, and if people are interested, that's where I would look up the literature. Yeah. And that's that's a 2022 randomized control trial, I believe. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I'm I'm a fan of of glutamine. Um, coming back to the the paper you mentioned, was the endpoint solely the leaky gut measure, or was there also a symptomatic correlation endpoint? I'm going to have to look up <laughs> that information. <laughs> it's the curse of doing a lot of uh, research, right? It's hard to keep it all straight. It might take me some time to find it, but um... yeah, and you know, uh, we don't have to belabor the point. Uh, you know, I think we can leave that open ended for people, which is. We're, we're trying to grapple with this data and come away with the best conclusions, but there's a lot of data nonetheless. Um, let me ask you about this. Um, probiotics. I've been a increasingly eager fan of probiotics, especially because over the past year and a half, myself and our research team, we have a PubMed saved search feed. And so every time there's a paper published, randomized control trial or better on probiotics, it comes through our feed and we review it. And even with that in mind, we do a monthly podcast where we recap the research that's been published in the past month. It's been super informative. Again, looking at good data, at least randomized control trials or systematic reviews or meta-analyses. And you're seeing increasing data looking at probiotics helping leaky gut. There's one meta-analysis in depression. There's the, the frontiers in immunology, which looked at, you know, again, leaky gut. There's a number of trials for IBS, some trials for constipation. And sure, sometimes the finding is the null, but most of the meta-analyses are finding benefit. So knowing that these are fairly low cost and fairly low side effect, I'm eager at the prospect of you know the utility that that probiotics have. Um, and given especially that frontiers in immunology paper, this one randomized twenty six randomized control trials. So they're using different formulas, different strains across these trials, but still finding, I'm presuming, enough homogeneity across the trials to be able to conclude in a a meta-analysis there's benefit. So the position I've been taking on this is it's probably not as particular as one highly specific strain if we're seeing benefits across different strains. And, and some trials have even done head-to-head -head comparisons on different strains and shown comparable benefit. And why I say all this is because on the one hand, I think we want to be scientific, specific, and accurate. On the other hand, I see some people who have a very hard time selecting a probiotic because they're so confused about what's the right species, what's the right strain. And in a lot of cases, my comment will be, well, geez, if we're looking at a meta-analysis of 26 trials and the formulas used vary across most of those trials, you might just want to target a well-constructed, you know, good manufacturing practices following companies probiotic. And that's probably going to be sufficient. Buy a bottle, try it for a few weeks, see how you do. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's my, uh, long winded lead into what are your thoughts on probiotics? Well, I mean, I think it, you make a very good point. Um, I, I, I was just glancing at some of the tables from our paper and, and, you know, one of the problems is that for most patients, uh, for, sorry, for most of the papers, the endpoints were actually, um, biomarkers rather than symptom responses. And so that's one thing. And the other point you made is that, that there was there's such a diverse um, probiotic that was used in the different trials. And it's very difficult to be absolutely sure whether you can make any any conclusion about any right. one. So, you know, I'm, I'm still keeping an open mind, quite honestly. I, I do think that some patients that, that we see um, do derive benefits. It's also possible that because I'm at a tertiary referral center, I'm probably seeing the patients who have tried it and not derived benefits. So I have a skewed view. Great point. Great point. Yeah. So I have to be very careful not to imply that that you know my practice is necessarily generalizable from that perspective. Yeah. 
Yep. So I come to the same, a very similar conclusion as you do, which is if a probiotic uh, has gone through a good manufacturing process, if it's approved for use, if it's available, um, if it contains some of the things that we have been talking about, which was um, this happened to be Bifidobacterium adolescensis and Bifidobacterium lactis in that particular study from, uh, uh, from Chicago. You know, if the probiotic contains those, I would have a little bit more confidence. Um, but that's as far as I can take it. Uh, so a okay. trial yeah. for patients improve seems to be a good idea. Um, they're relatively inexpensive and uh, they seem to be very safe. Good. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad we have some some common ground there. And uh, we're working on a paper to try to summarize some of this data. And, and, you know, I'm sure you have a lot on your plate, but I might send you an email, just just a, a heads up to get your perspective. And I promise we'll give you a nice cogent summary of the data. But as someone who's always trying to acknowledge my blind spots and my biases, having someone else who can just review quickly sort of the bullet points underpinning my scientific case is is always very welcome. So no commitment necessary on that, but I'll just throw that out there as something that would be cool to get your perspective on. I'd be very happy to take a look at it. Yeah, no, that, that would be, that would be great. Um, do you have any closing thoughts or, or maybe, you know, cautions or encouragements that you'd want to leave people with? So I, I think that it's important to appreciate that there is uh, such a thing as a leaky gut. That's the first simple thing. The second is that um, we do need to be a little bit skeptical about you know, the application of this to diseases where the connection doesn't make what I would call common sense. Um, right. I, I'd like to understand how Alzheimer's, dementia, and autism necessarily relate particularly to this phenomenon. I can certainly understand it in the context of um, certain joint diseases, especially if there's an underlying inflammation of the intestine. And then the final point, I think, is that we need to be much more rigorous with our diagnostic criteria, our reference ranges. And I'm hoping that in the future, there will be you know, more assays that we can apply in the clinical practice to help really establish in the individual patient that is this is a target for treatment that is worthwhile for that individual patient. So those would be my closing comments. Great comments. Uh, Michael, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. I really appreciate your your humble and intellectually curious perspective that you take on this and also your your just breadth of knowledge and all the research that you're doing. So uh, again, it's been a real pleasure. And I'm sure I can speak for our audience in saying that uh, I and we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure participating in this with you. <laughs>